Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Crockcast podcast. I'm your host, Nate. And today I'm joined by the host of the Venom Exchange Radio uh, podcast, Mr. Nipper Reed. Reed, welcome to the show. Hello, mate. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So, uh, you want to get started on uh, how you first got into uh, reptiles and uh, kind of what your career path that led you to where you are now? Yeah, sure. Um, I think my story is the same as everybody else you've probably interviewed. Um, when you're small, you're really into dinosaurs and that sort of thing. My earliest memory of really being into herps and stuff like that, um, I'm lucky enough to have uh, grown up in London uh, or around London. And my granddad took me to the Natural History Museum when I was about four years old. And I can still remember it. And four years old is an awfully long time ago for me now. Uh, and they had live fire salamanders there, which is salamandra salamandra, beautiful European species. And um, I was just blown away. I was allowed to hold it, which you probably can't do now for health and safety, but this was a long time ago. And um, yes, I was absolutely fascinated at four years old by this beautiful little black and bright yellow salamander. And that kind of snowballed from there. And then when you get a little bit older, um, the UK at that time when I was growing up had a lot of uh, ex-war fortifications and stuff like that left over from the war. And as kids, you know, it's like you make a camp and then other kids make a camp and then you all attack one another and you have a great day out. Again, you probably can't do that now under health and safety. You'd have to go to a safe space or something like that. But I remember around these camps, I used to see snakes and lizards. And at the time, I didn't know what they were. I was only young. But then you start to think, well, I wonder what that is. And I had to look in a book. Um, modern people won't know what that is. That's before the internet. So you had to actually look something up in a book. And they were adders. They were Vipera berus, the only venomous snake that we get in the UK. But they were really common around these bombed out sort of uh, old buildings. And also uh, Vipara sutoka, which is... It's called the common lizard. Unfortunately, it's not very common anymore. But those were the first two herps I saw kind of in the field. And it's it's snowballed from there. Um, and then when the Internet kicked off big time, uh, there was a group in Europe and they were called Club 100. And at that time, the goal was to see 100 species of European herp in the field. And that was quite a big thing. So I thought, well, that's a great idea. So I started doing it. Um, Jeroen's Spraybroek was like a pioneer of this, a friend of mine. And it, I just started going to Europe and photographing herps in situ. Um, there's only in Europe, if we count mainland Europe, there's 240 different species uh, of herp. And at the minute, I now have six species left to see it keep, it changes almost daily because when you think you've seen everything somebody then splits a species and then you've you know even though it looks exactly the same you've got there going yeah you know, it's a little brown gecko but now you've got to go to the particular island that that split is on and see it so i've got i've got at the moment i think taxonomically i've got six species left so i hope to be the first english person to have photographed every european herp in situ um, there's only a few other people have actually done it. There's uh, Bobby Bock from Holland. He's seen everything and photographed it. Jeroen has photographed everything and seen it. He's from Belgium. And Jan van der Voort from Belgium has seen everything. But those are the only people in Europe that have ever done it. So I'm hoping to be the first person from the UK to do it. Um, so, yeah, I've also, uh, same as everybody, when you start field herping, you start thinking, oh, I'd like to keep some stuff at home. So uh, I've over the years had a huge collections of various different things. Um, and at the minute I have a building in the garden, which to my partner's dismiss is absolutely full of various snakes and lizards. That's where we are now. So uh, what are those six species you still need to get? Uh, right, I've got an input on spot. So my nemesis is uh, a large, uh, largest rat snake, um, which you think would be really easy to see, uh, which is uh, a Suramantes, which is uh, the blotched rat snake. 
Um, and I have been to many countries in Europe trying to find it. I found loads of sheds. I've seen them dead on the road. Obviously, you can't count dead specimens, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd have probably finished by now. Um, I, I've done so many trips in the areas for these things. I did a trip earlier this year with the sole target was that particular snake. We saw a lot of other nice stuff, but I just cannot find a live one at the minute. It's super frustrating. So there's the, the box rat snake. Um, They've just recently split the green lizards uh, in the in in Europe. So there's a new species from an island called Naxos. So I need to go to this island, which is not as easy as it sounds. You've got a which which will mean me flying to Athens in Greece from the UK, then getting a small prop plane from Athens to the island of Naxos. Uh, and then trying to find this this one type of lizard so i've got to do that i need to go to crete to find a gecko which they've recently split it looks exactly the same as the other types of gecko from that area that i've already photographed there is absolutely no morphological difference whatsoever but it's been given species status so i need to see that um, i'm off to milos in a couple of weeks time which is one of the cyclades islands uh, and then I need to photograph on there the blunt nose viper, um, which I'd already seen in Cyprus, but now the ones on Milos have been elevated to a full species. So I need to photograph them on Milos as well. Um, Milos has also got a, a little tiny wall lizard, which I need to see. Uh, what else? What else? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then it. it for completeness, it depends. Some people count it, some people don't count it. So there's an island called Samos, which is literally just off the coast of Turkey. You could swim to Turkey from it. So some people count it as Europe, some people don't. Um, and there's a couple of uh, lizards that I need to see on there. So that will be it, hopefully. And then I can concentrate more on the, the US, which is my great passion at the moment. So... Uh... What all do you have uh, out in your shed at the moment? Shed? Shed? It's not a bloody Outside building, garden. It's garden not building. a shed. It's beautiful. Um, hey, I keep uh, mine in a shed. I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, that's good, but no. Um, I, I have to, because I'm in the UK, I have to have DWA license, which is a dangerous wild animals license, because I keep venomous. So the building has to be built to a certain standard. Um, got to be double skin brick it's got to have double entry and all sorts of you know legal, which is good i think legal requirements um i'm just in a kind of period of flux at the minute in terms of and i'm sure you're the same um although you're a lot younger than me clearly you go through different stages with your keeping don't you so yeah you get you get your first snake and it's marvelous and you think oh, i'll just get one more and then before you know it you've got a hundred snakes or, or whatever it is you're keeping lizards or whatever it is you're keeping. Um, and you then think, right, I'm going to breed this. So you, be, you just get pairs and double pairs of everything. And then you suddenly realize this is tons of work and I'm not enjoying it. And then you think, right, I'm going to thin it down and just keep what I really enjoy. So I'm kind of in the stage now where um I'm thinning everything down. I'm just about to completely redo the snake building. So literally floor to ceiling, all new cages and new electric, everything. Uh, so at the minute, my collection's the smallest it's been. Um, and I'm really changing the direction because I was really into arboreal pit vipers. So I had lots of green stuff that sat on twigs for ages. Don't have any of those anymore. Uh, I've got some uh, Aetherius clarecus, the... Um, west african pit vipers um but that that's about it's the arboreal stuff so and the direction i'm going to go in is going to be european vipers from iberia and north american rattlesnakes and north american king snakes milk snakes because the temperature requirements are all very very similar but what i have got at the moment um i'll give you a run through for, if i may forget things uh so i'll have to do it thinking of the room in my head as i go around uh, so starting at the back, I keep Apodora, um, which is hands down my favourite non-venomous snake. They are just beasts of snakes. I mean, 
you know, people go on about their scrub pythons, but Apodora eat scrub pythons. They are just phenomenal snakes. I would recommend them to anybody. If you, they're quite hard to get hold of, I believe. They are in Europe. I don't know about in the States. But if you can I've get... I've rarely seen them, so... Yeah, I've got some... I, got, I know people that keep them. I've got some friends that keep them. But if you can get them, get them. They are another level. They remind me of non-venomous king cobras. They have the same sort of size and intelligence. They really, they look at you, and you can just tell that they're just judging you. They they are phenomenal, um, and by far the strongest snake. And I've kept retics and I've kept scrubs, but Apodora again, another level. So I've got the Apodora. Uh, what's next to them? Apodora. I've got uh, Sanzinia. Um, else Apodora Sanzinia. I've got water pythons, the Fuscus, which I really like, really underrated snake. And why they're not more popular in the hobby is beyond me. They're beautifully iridescent. They've got lovely orange or yellow bellies, depending on where they're from. I think they're fantastic. So I've got a group of those. Maclots pythons, I've got a group of those. Um, and they're the best training snakes. If you want to keep venomous, just keep a group of Maclots. And if you're not bitten in six months, then you're more than ready for for venomous because they're just the most aggressive snakes ever uh what else have i got uh going around oh uh i've got way too many jamaican boas um i do like a jamaican boa but i've got too many i need to to thin some of those out so i've got jamaican boas uh i've got papworm carpet pythons uh then i've got a uh, large group of northern pines uh, i've got pyra milana and la blocci i've got sinaloan milk um what else what else what else oh i think that might be it for non-venomous Oh, no, I've got uh, langahar, the Madagascan leaf nose snakes. I've got Madagascan cat snakes. Uh, I've got some corns. Uh, what else? Then I've got the Arthurus clericus. I've got Sistrurus miliaris streckery. And I've got Sistrurus miliaris barbary. And I've got Sistrurus miliaris barbary stripe phase. Um, uh, that might be it for snakes at the minute. And then I've got two groups of Timon Lepidus, which are the European biggest lizards. They're sort of, they're sort of Australian small monitor lizard size. Uh, right. Various different fil various different Felsumas, Cochi, Clemeri, Grandis, Standing Eye. I've got Ligodactus. Conroe eye, Williams eye, um, Underwoodysaurus, uh, Oegira, Manolis, the Velvet Gecko, Oegira's Cas Castle Nawi, Velvet Geckos. Uh, what else? Oh, I've got all the, um, what is the Latin for those? I have the, uh, the, Bagwanalis cave geckos. Gonoreosaurus, I think the Latin for that is cave geckos. Then I've got Colonix variegatus, Colonix mitratus, Colonix uh, brevis. I think I'm missing stuff. Right. Oh, I've got some fan foot geckos. I think that might be it. Oh no, I've got four spot geckos, some leopard geckos, morning geckos, golden geckos. They're all wild in the building. Just they just clear up any bugs that I drop. Um, and I've got uh, Turkish geckos and Moorish geckos again, just wild in the building, just to clear up anything. They seem to breed like mad in the, in the building. I think that's it. Oh no, uh, I've got some antares here as well uh maculosa um oh brazilian rainbow boas i think that's it i'm sure i've forgotten a few bits and bobs but there's a few bits but as i say um 
International Snake Day is coming up in Europe, so I will drive over there and I've got uh, pre-orders waiting to collect for Vipira Latas Gaditania, which is a beautiful little viper from Spain with a horn on its nose. I've got pre-orders for Vipira Renardi, which is one of my favourite European snakes. I've kept them all, I kept loads of them before and I got rid of them and I really regretted it. So I've managed to track some down because they're not easy to get. Um, and I've got uh, Crotalus Serastes as well on pre-order. So I'm looking forward to having some sidewinders. That'd be really, really cool. Um, and at the show, I'm looking to buy more milk snakes because I don't know what it's like in the States. I think you're, you're better in the States because I've been looking on four classifieds. For us in Europe, it's really, really hard to get decent non-morph examples, like locality examples of some of the milks and kings. The morph stuff yeah. is easy is easy to get, but to get decent non-morph stuff is hard. So I want to get a nice group of, um, or add to the Sinaloa, and um, I want to get Campbell Eye because I think it's one of the nicest looking milk snakes. I think it's amazing. Not the Halloween ones, but the what they call sock heads, I think are just beautiful. So I get some of those and some of the South American uh, milks, I think are outstanding. So try and track some of them down. I will also try and get Cloud Rye uh, and Lepidus if I see some nice examples um, at the show. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. But that, so the collection should just be snake wise. I should be keeping the big boids, the, the Fuscus and the Sanzinia and the Apodora, but I think everything else will be going. Um, and I'll just have Pituophus, um, Lampropeltis, and then rattlesnakes or Euro vipers. And that'll be me. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something a, a bit about a kind of difference between American and European herbaric culture. That's uh, something I've always been kind of interested in. So uh, from the, your European herbaric culture perspective, what we say are some of the major differences between the two? Oh, it's easy because it drives me up the wall. I'm always moaning to um, my American friends about stuff. Number one, you never use any Latin names for anything, which annoys the hell out of everybody because your common names for stuff aren't the, the common names that are used in other countries. So it's super confusing. Um, in Europe, you don't ever use common names for anything. If I was even selling a corn snake or a, a, a milk snake, I wouldn't put milk snake for sale. It would be lamp propeltis, whichever species it was for sale. That way, anyone that speaks German or speaks Spanish or speaks Italian will know exactly what we're talking about. Everyone just uses Latin all the time. Um, you, if you, the Americans, and I'm always moaning at my friends for this, oftentimes I'll look on classified sales or something like that, and it'll be a, a rattlesnake species that I've never heard of. I think, oh, it's great, it's a new species, whatever. But when I look, it's a subspecies, but they've just missed the subspecies name bit out and they've just used the end bit. That's that's quite frustrating. Um, I think America is kind of going European now, and we're kind of going American in terms of keeping in racks is kind of getting more popular here. Whereas I think in America, naturalistic setups are kind of getting more popular and racks are getting less popular. Um, but the, the sort of normality for Europe would be have less species, but the cage sizes are so much bigger in um, in Europe, I think. I mean, when, when I chat to like Eric or Phil or whatever, when they say, oh, yeah, I've got an extra six foot carpet python, oh, what size? Oh, it's in a four foot cage. You're like, mm. in the UK, it'd be in a much bigger cage or in, in, um, in Europe. Um, so much stuff is bioactive in Europe, or if it's not 100% bioactive, it's much more naturalistic. And particularly with the venomous stuff, there's almost as much attention on the cage design in terms of uh, the plants that are in there or the hardscaping in there. It's almost like Aquarius. It's almost like fish keepers. You know, it gets to a point where that is almost a bigger part of the hobby is actually keeping the animal. Um, so some of the setups you see for the Viper Keepers and that, like they, they've got like works of art. They're they're, they're amazing. Um, I think those are the 
and the prices some of the i mean stuff that you're paying pence for in america would just be you'd have to sell a kidney for in europe and, mm -hmm. and vice versa when you i see a chance to film people like that when they're going oh yeah if you appear at amadites which is quite a popular venomous snake in america the nose horn viper i look on former classified and they're like six seven hundred dollars they're like 50 quid i can get them for 50 quid do you know what i mean it's just crazy and yet rattlesnake prices what you're paying pence for a rattlesnake i'm then paying the 500 600 pound for so i suppose it's just what's available isn't it? it's just what's commonly available and i think some of the wild caught import lines are easier for the states so some things that come in wild caught are very cheap like insularis blue insularis in the states aren't that expensive are they i, I don't think from Rosiris insularis from uh, komodo wet are that sort of area they're not super expensive yeah. in the states i think you know yeah possibly even around a hundred dollars or something like that whereas a blue insularis in the uk is probably 750 pounds to 800 pounds but i just think it's just easy for you to import them where we can't get them but um i think that's the, the main difference is i think naturalistic fibs rather than you very, very rarely see anything plastic in a European viv. You won't see like the white tubes for um, snakes to sit on and, and stuff like that. It, it's all very, very naturalistic. And collections tend to be smaller, but bigger cages, more naturally set up. I'd say that's the difference. Gotcha. So, uh... What be some uh, other species I say are really commonly kept in Europe, but not commonly seen in America, and uh, vice versa? Um, I say what's very what is very popular in the UK, but not common because we cannot get hold of them. Are all the dry marcons? They're uh, ridic they are ridiculously expensive. I mean, stupidly expensive over here, um, and they're so popular, but you just can't get them. You literally anybody that's breeding them and there's probably oh there's probably less than five people breeding them in the uk and their lists sell out almost immediately um you just can't get hold of them so they're super expensive they're really really popular but conversely things like um san francisco garter snakes and stuff like that they're pence yeah. which i think are quite hard to get hold of in the in uh, in the states or even legally keep um any other the american venomous stuff uh, with the exception of copperheads is is normally quite expensive for us over here um certainly things like um let me think of an example cloud and lepidus aren't too expensive um they're probably uh between three and five hundred pounds each but things like a decent um, pyrus or something like that, you're probably looking at seven, eight hundred pounds for a decent example. Whereas in the states, there's no in, there's no in near there. Um, even things like uh, pyromelana and, and noblocka, you're probably looking at two hundred and fifty pounds for a sub adult. Whereas I'm sure you're not paying an equivalent price for that sort of thing in in the US. Um, we get a lot of uh wild caught stuff that you probably don't see so much purely because our laws aren't there's no fish and wildlife in the uk if it gets into the uk you can have it sort of thing so we see a lot of weird unusual species i think in the uk um certainly because of our ties with australia there's, uh, there's a lot of australian stuff available in europe a lot of it smuggled through various places czech republic and stuff like that um so we probably have a greater range of australian or certainly it fascinates me when i listen to the chats of my friends in in, in the us you're so oh this is lasic bloodline or this is such and such bloodline you can trace it all the way back no way in the in in europe it will be you know everything's just smuggled in and imported you're not worried about bloodlines or anything like that yeah it, there's so there's so many bloodlines it's it's just ridiculous so i think that's, uh, that's probably the main difference 
I call that healthy genetic diversity. So, yeah, hundred hundred percent. I mean, the amount of I mean, even the even the geckos, they are there is so much stuff available from you know from Australia or New Zealand, um, and just you know, um, like the spy even the spider vipers are available. The Pseudorastes arachnoides. There's never been a legal export of those. And yet they're at the shows. You can buy them. You know, it, it makes me laugh. You can, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of stuff you can at the international shows. There's house and then there's ham. Um, and, and I've said it a number of times. When you walk around in the venomous rooms for either one of those shows, you will be able to buy every every single species of European viper and every species of American North American rattlesnake now a lot of the european vipers are strictly protected there's never you know they shouldn't be there but they're all there at the shows you can you can buy a scene it, it's incredible <laughs> yeah um you mentioned that uh dry mark on is uh kind of uh the high demand low supply snake in the uk at the moment uh, yeah, um, just from what I've seen here in the states, they're not exactly that uh, easy to get either, especially uh, eastern indigos since they have the federal protection status, so you can't sell them over state lines. But even like imported Central American and and stuff like that usually go for over a grand. So I guess yeah, dry mark on our dry mark, dry mark on our expensive across the board. Yeah, um, I think. Equivalent price, you're looking at probably cheapest price two and a half thousand for one. Uh, in if you can get hold of one, if you can get hold of one, um, <laughs> even things big like if. um, a big if, um, black pines, black pine snakes, female black yeah. pine snake will set you back probably between 500 and 800 pounds in the UK. Um, crazy yeah even mexican black king snakes which a while ago you couldn't give away they are now somewhere in the region of 250 pounds each yeah hmm. something that most people in america are probably using for snake food um yeah it's uh, yeah. It, it is weird it is weird yeah so i can have a change of course but uh, you do host uh, several, co-host several podcasts. Uh, yeah. You want to talk about those? Uh, yeah, um, Eric from um, NPR, who I'm sure everybody is aware of, the Podfather. Um, Eric, Eric and I do uh, a field herping podcast. Um, it kind of got interrupted a little bit by COVID, um, but we have got a lot of episodes backed up in the pipeline, which we can now now put out. Um, we, we just felt that field herping is, is, is becoming such a popular activity for everybody. I mean, I've done it for 30 years, but a lot of people are just starting to do it. And there's some fantastic people on the Internet that go out field herping and make great YouTube videos. And it's becoming really popular. You know, people like uh, Lou, Lou Boyer and, and uh, other people. So we felt that there should be a podcast. So we, we've done, we do the field herping podcast. Um, and then Phil and I, we both have a love for Venomous. We both over the years kept venomous well, between us i couldn't imagine how many species we've kept um phil kind of leans towards african stuff he's very into his cobras and his stiletto snakes and his beloved ring calves and stuff like that um whereas i've always sort of lent towards arboreal stuff like Etheris and trimerosaurus um and rattle and, the, and then the rattlesnakes and stuff like that so we've got such a uh, an experience between us and we just love talking about it and talking to anybody that's into the venomous stuff so we thought there isn't really a venomous podcast at the minute so we thought we'd um, pop one out and we've we've been really really blessed we've had some cracking guests on there some really uh super interesting people so it, it you know it's just a joy it's just the chat snakes or scorpions which has done an episode on scorpions because venom is venom um yeah so it's not it's, it's not just snakes we'll be doing spider episodes um it's mainly state centric because that's what me and Phil know about. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good to have a little variety for anyone that's interested in the venom. And yeah, we'll we'll, we'll talk about field herping. We'll talk about conservation. We'll talk about um, 
captive keeping, we'll talk about bike procedures, you know, just general stuff centered around envenomation and stuff like that. There's a couple of other little podcasts in the pipeline. Uh, we've got a gecko podcast that's um, being put together, which will be Phil, Eric and myself. So again, Phil, Eric and myself really love our, uh, our geckos. So we thought we'll do a little gecko, uh, you know, only a monthly one, not weekly, but uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah. So, uh, what would you say are some of the most interesting guests you've had on? Oh, that's that's harsh. I think I think with the Venom ah. podcast, with the Venom podcast, I think all of the um, guests we've had have been carefully chosen because they all bring something different. I mean, we've had very famous people on there, like Johan Marias, um, but we've also had um, Ty Iper. So just completely different perspectives. You know, we've got a female herpetologist, very well respected, massive collection of elapids. And then you've got Johan Marias, who's been in the hobby for, or been in the round herpetoculture for the last 40 years, has written so many books, um, does so much work with conservation and snake bite. We had, uh, we just had, um, Paul on with his scorpions, which was fascinating because I know absolutely nothing about scorpions, so that was great to have him on. But everyone we've had, we've had people from the Kenyan um, Venom Institute. It, it's 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 everyone has just brought something different. It's been really cool. And then obviously on the Field Herbin podcast, we had the legend <laughs> that was Mark O'Shea. Uh, you could just listen to him talk for hours and hours and hours. I mean, the man is, you know discovered new species, had species named after him. He was on the original Ruscal Python ex exhibition, expeditions. He's done so much in Papua New Guinea. Um, he found Antaresia in Papua New Guinea. He, you know, he's, he's caught wild Apodora. Um, he's done a lot of work with venomous snakes in Papua New Guinea. You, you can honestly just listen to him for, for, for ages. Um, hmm. Yeah. But everyone that comes on has got something different to add. You know, that's that's the beauty of it. You're just getting other people's stories. Yeah. So uh, with your uh, collection going forward, is there any species that if you could, you would want to work with? Oh, how long have you got? Um, yes, there's loads. The only thing that stops me is is money really money in space is the, is the problem that all uh, all keepers have uh, as i say i'm thinning out so much stuff and the plan is to go with sort of iberian vipers and uh american uh, stuff so would like because i am a total geek i would like to get all of the subspecies of crotalus cerastes which well, there's three subspecies um the circumbobus is very easy to get. It's one of the commonest snakes you'll see at a show, that they're easy. But the other, to get Crotalus cerastes cerastes is hard. I can't remember off the top of my head what the other subspecies is, but they are much harder to track down. So I like all the subspecies for that. Um, Iberian viper-wise, I'm getting viper latas gadatania from Tunisia, which is Africa because they sort of go into Europe and they just cross into Africa. Um, mm. Which, and I think they're going to elevate that to a full species. So I also want Vipula tascaditania from Portugal, because different slightly. I want Vipula tas latas, different venom, same, same sort of snake, slightly different looking. May split the species, I don't know, but I'd love to get some Vipula tas latas. I'll probably pick up some of those at the show uh, that's coming up. I want uh, Viper Siwani. Um, I would like the con color and the striped form of that because they come in various different forms. Um, I want some Viper Aspis, the Pira Aspis from the, uh, I think it's Sinikiri from the Spanish border. I'd also love Vipira Kaznikovi, uh, Vipira Lotievi, 
which I used to keep and I shouldn't have sold. The Vipera eriwenensis, which I used to keep and shouldn't have sold. Um, so that's the kind of viper wise. Um, milk snake wise, I just look, I want some decent examples of, as I said before, of the South American bigger milk snakes. Um, particularly if I could get this, the pair, and I saw them on Fauna Classified, and they're really cheap in the States, but over here you just can't get them. The ones from the Andes are just phenomenal looking, uh, beautiful snakes. Um, if anybody's listening that's into milk snakes, I would, they're on Fauna Classified, just buy them because they're hard to get pure examples of them. Um, rattlesnake wise, apart from the uh, Serastes, I want and I'm, I'm going to be really geeky because I don't have space to collect loads. So I want some really nice examples of Clowberi. Now, the clouds I want are from the area in Arizona that I was lucky enough to go herping um, a few months ago. But they are completely protected in Arizona. So they're not for sale in America. They are for sale in Europe, though. Um, so uh, I'd like some, yeah, I'd like some Arizona examples of Clowberi, um, and I'd like some decent examples of Lepidus and Marullus. Um, but I could keep going for hours. There's so many snakes I want. It's uh, it's crazy. L lizard wise, um, there's not that much more. St oh, some other stuff I forgot to mention. I keep Strophurus as well. The Australians and some of the Australian decals. So I'd like I'd like some uh, Spinigerus um, and Elderi Strophurus, um, and I want the biggest European lizard, which is Timon nevidensis. So I'd like a pair of those. I also keep stuff out in in my garden, which I forgot to mention. So I keep in outdoor enclosures. I keep uh, Lacerta bilineata, which is one of the big green lizards. I keep a group of those. I keep a group of Podarsis muralis nigra ventris uh, and another Podarsis muralis whose name escapes me. So they're wall lizards. I keep groups of those. I keep um, tiger salamanders in a big enclosure in the garden. So I've got two different forms of tiger salamander and also spatial toads I keep in the garden as well. So yeah, there's I, I, yeah, I should be taking a fair bit of money to the show, apart from my pre-orders, so I should just wander around. I'm vending the show as well, so I get I get in early. So I should just wander around and just hang around in the Venomous Room and see what's what's nice. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, you did some herping in Arizona where you found the Glabri. Uh So yeah. what would be some of your uh, favorite places you've ever gone herping? Uh, my favourite, well, um, I've been fortunate enough to hurt many places around, around the world. Um, Cuba was one of the nicest places I've hurt. I'm not sure that's easily accessible for people from the US. I'm not really sure. But I, for herping, I thought it was absolutely great. If, it, a lot of lizard species, some great amphibians, nice big snakes. I was fortunate enough to see Cuban boa, uh, and they have a crocodile out there as well. Um, but I just love yeah. the lizards. The curly, curly tail lizards out there were phenomenal. Uh, and the toads were huge. They're like cane toad size toads. Cuba was cool. Um, for my money, um, you cannot beat Greece for herping because you've got such different habitats. Um, so you can, if you hurt the Peloponnese area of Greece, you've, you've got such a range of, of habitats. You've got everything from small boas. The sand boas live there. You've got a load of really cool venomous snakes. You've got a Vipera amodites or a Vipera xanthina if you if you go slightly further up the, the Peloponnese. You've got a lot of racers and that sort of thing. Phenomenal lizards. Um, and the little Greek islands, a lot of the Greek islands have little endemic species on them. So you might have a tiny little island, but it's got a lizard that's only found there or a salamander that's only found there, which is really, really cool. I love Spain, uh, although Spain is really hard herping. Um, in terms of it's hard when you're out herping in certain areas of Spain, it's hard to find somewhere where you could eat. So you end up just living off 
shite that you buy in a, in a garage, you know, for days and days and days, or just not eating for days. Um, but the species in Spain are phenomenal. It is, we've got so many nice viper species in Spain. Italy is lovely. It's the polar opposite of Spain. The food and the culture and the alcohol and the coffee are all amazing in Italy. You don't want to hurt. You just want to lay around and eat and drink. Um, but they've got some really nice species as well. Um, Slovenia is cool as a country. Slovenia is really small, but it's got a phenomenal amount of species for the size of the country. I really, I, I, Israel, I think is hands down the, one of the best countries if you're into reptiles. I think Israel's probably one of the best countries you can visit because it's easy. Everyone speaks English. It's easy to get food. The road system's great, but there's so many herbs. Um, you'd easily, with you know, not too much effort, you'd easily find 30, 40 species in a week. Just herping out there. Very, wow. very cool. And they have got some beasts of venomous snakes. They've got sore scale vipers. Um, they've got um, the big Deboya. Um, Deboya. Uh, what else have they got? Oh, they've got the. Um, Black Cobras, the uh, Waltronesia, they've got the Atract Aspis, the Leto Snakes, um, they've got the Telescopus. It's, it's a joy helping out there, and it, it is generally easy to, to see stuff out there. Um, and if you want to go about further afield, you've got like places like Malaysia and Borneo. If you like amphibians, go to you know, Borneo, is just insane. Um, You've got some cool snakes there as well. You've got some nice um, pit vipers in Borneo, but amphibian diversity is, in, is, is incredible. The same for Malaysia. Um, I'm just trying to think. I've been, I've been fortunate enough to go to so many places. New Zealand is harder herping, but it's got some beautiful species of geckos there in New Zealand. Um, I'd recommend that. But um, most countries in the world, you can there's some good stuff. My the thing that's exciting me, I've you know, Australia. I wouldn't mind herping Australia. It's not at the top of my list. The US is top of my list at the moment. And I think all of you people in the US, you take the US for granted. But if you take a step back from that and look at the species you've actually got and the diversity you've actually got, the US is phenomenal. Honestly, all the Europeans just want to hurt the US. It's, <laughs> it, it, you know, you've got uh 38 species of rattlesnake um you've got some phenomenal amphibians like you know you've got hellbenders and mud puppies salamander wise the appalachians and all that sort of stuff you've got probably over 100 species of salamander alone um <laughs> and, oh, it's, it's just beautiful and then you've got all your different lizards you've got liar snakes you've got your milk snakes, you've got your shovel nose snakes. It, it, it's phenom absolutely phenomenal. And you're never going to beat rattlesnakes. I mean, it's what everybody wants to see. And I think because it's it's kind of easy, air quotes, for you to see rattlesnakes, I think you Americans kind of take rattlesnakes for granted. But it is the as far as I'm concerned, they're the absolute pinnacle of seeing venomous snakes. I know, you know, Europe's got some very, very pretty venomous snakes, but they don't compare to how cool some of the rattlesnakes you've got are. Well, then, as an American, I kind of feel kind of flattered and proud about that. But uh, in my particular home state, it's actually pretty hard to find rattlesnakes just because. Where, uh, where are you from? Have, where are you? Ohio. Okay. So we have two native species uh, uh, Massasagua, which is Cystursus catabensis, and uh, uh, Crotalus hortus. So Timbers, oh. but both of, both of those are state endangered, like super rare. Had to go really hike up to some really remote pockets in order to find them. So, I, I mean, even uh, North, yeah, even copperheads are not that easy to find here. So, okay, yeah, that's well, that's really high on my list of things I want to see in the wild at the moment. Copperhead. I know for you it's probably bread and butter stuff, but for me, copperheads such just an go iconic down snake. Yeah. Yeah, just go down south and drive around for like an hour, pretty much. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm I'm hoping to do uh, go over and, and and see Eric and do Pennsylvania, and 
you know, Eric's so focused on Australia. He loves Australia. It's amazing. And I keep saying to him, do you know that your state has so many cool reptiles and amphibians in it? You know, they, they do have the um, the hellbenders and they've got the timbers and they've got copperheads. And uh, I think they've got um, they got sustrus there as well, I think. Maybe just on the edge. Yeah, yeah catabensis, sustrus, catabensis, it should go be in Pennsylvania. I know they range all the way up to like upstate New York as well. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's just phenomenal to have that on your doorstep, for want of a better word. Um, but yeah, I mean, Arizona, you, you probably um, heard me speak about it before, but Arizona absolutely blew my mind. What a place. I mean, I could just literally walk around there for months and months and months. It was, it was, you know, the habitat, the lighting, the species, and not just the species of reptiles, but the plants and the birds, everything was incredible. It's, you know, absolutely phenomenal. I'm hoping we're going to do a Utah trip early next year because we got the, we did really well. We got the rattlesnakes from the sort of the bottom end, but we, the next group of species is kind of top end of Arizona and into Utah. So uh, I'm yeah. stoked for that. It's just, I mean, I've not even been to Texas. I need to go to Texas. Texas has got some great species. It's crazy. Yeah, I've done a lot of, done a fair bit of herping in uh, East Texas. So like I say, it is pretty, pretty nice to go herping in. So. Yeah, I think I'm in California, Baja and stuff like that. It's just, it's insane what you've got. I mean, the, the diversity. Yeah. I- yeah, I was actually uh, looking it up the other week. Uh, actually, the U.S. has the highest diversity of freshwater turtle species of any country in the planet, which is kind of surprising. But I guess if you look at like how wet and uh, river, how many rivers and lakes we have, like especially in the southeast, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, but uh, but how many people are going out and saying, right, I want to see every species of North American turtle? Not that many. That's what people should be doing. No, that's what they should. Um, Dustin, the, the the friend of ours that very kindly guided us around Arizona, I, he's inspirational in terms of he's always out herping. If he's not working, he's out herping. How his missus puts up with him, I have no idea because he is literally um, in his truck out herping. And I've, I've, you know, even a, a couple of months ago, I was just messaging back and forth. I was saying, you must see every species in Arizona. You live in Arizona, make that your goal. And it, it, that's what he's, he's smashing through. You know, he's, he's a phenomenal herper. He, he will do it, no, no problem at all. But um, yeah, if, if I lived in the States, I, I'm not, and I don't even know what the numbers are, certainly a lot greater than Europe, but I would have to see every single species in the, you know, in the States, however long that took. Uh- that would probably take a while. I think it's probably somewhere around 600 species. Well, I'm, I might actually have uh, the old uh, Audubon reptile field guide around here somewhere. That I might have to look up just to see what the total number is. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, I presume it, it, it's doable. I mean, it's going to take a lot of time and money and effort, but yeah. what a goal. What a thing to be able to say you've done. So, uh, other than the uh, United States, and you mentioned some other places, uh, what be some places you that are really high up on your list of you really want to go herping, and in particular, what are some species you would really want to knock off uh, on your yeah. herping list? Well, um, my next trips are already planned for next year. Um, as I said, uh, Naxos, Crete, um, and Utah. Those are the ones that are already booked and planned. I quite like to go to Samos just for completeness. But if time and money would allow, um, Japan is super high on my list of places to go. Um, they've got some venomous species there, um, which the um, can't remember the common name for them. It begins like with M- Mamushis. Mamushis, well done you, yeah. They got those. The um the little it was like uh, this is like pseudo or something like that. 
I think they're gloidius. I think they're gloidius is the Latin okay. for those. I could be wrong. Um, and yeah, I, to see those in the wild, um, Lou flips them all the time when he's out there, like they're really common. But just to see those in the wild will be insane. And there's some really, really nice pit vipers in Japan, which I quite like to see. I'd like to see some killbacks as well. Um, and my, on my bucket list, I have two things which are both water related. Three, I guess I know I have three things water related. I don't know why they're all water related. It's weird. Um, one is to swim with manatees. So hopefully next year I'm going to go and see Phil do some herping because I want to see Sisturus in the wild and then go to clear water and swim some manatees. The other thing is swim with um, giant salamanders in Japan. Which a friend of mine did it's just just amazing i mean uh, you know an amphibian that's as long as you when you're in the water yeah, that <laughs> is just it's just mental so that would be really cool yeah. and then the, the, the other thing is 100 percent, yeah um and then the other thing is to try and get over to eric's i want to see the rattlesnakes and copperheads but i also want to try and swim get in the water with hellbenders I think that'll be yeah. get some underwater photography of hellbenders would be those are that's my big bucket list. But yeah, no, Japan would be absolutely phenomenal. And then yeah. again, you know, if I was invited on an Australia trip and I could afford it, there's a lot of stuff in Australia that I want to see. Obviously, um, it's more believe it or not, uh, in Australia, it's more geckos that I, I'm interested in because I keep the Australian gecko. So I, I would love yeah, to see. Oh, Oedura in the wild. I'd love to see knobtails in the wild. I'd love to see Stephurus in the wild. And then I'd also love to see um, things like inland Taipan and stuff like that. It would be crazy. Yeah. And yeah, for me, for Australia, I would more like to see like the pythons and varanids, but I guess that's just goes with my interests. I mean, I, I keep carpets and scrubs, so. Oh, okay. What scrubs do you keep? Uh, I have a... A uh, juvenile pair of uh, Tanabar, so the Somalia okay. Nada. Yeah, nice, very nice. A again, quite rare in the U in in the UK. Um, all the scrubs are reasonably hard to get. I've, I've sold mine now, but um, I had Arrow Island ones, which were, were absolutely beautiful. But yeah, you just, scrubs never very common at shows. You see them occasionally. I think you get a lot more wild caught imports than we can get. Yeah, I've never seen them at a show either, and from what just what I looked at, they're not that common online either. So, I think I just think right now the imports are not that common coming in that frequently yeah. at the current moment. So, uh, yeah. oh, it just reminded me talking of imports. Something else that I keep, which I forgot to mention, um, mangroves. Keep mangroves as well. Again, the prices of those have gone ridiculously high because there's no imports coming in. Hmm. So, yeah, but you mentioned Japan. It's like the more I think about, it, the more I actually want to go herping there. Just because all the more I think about, it, the more the herps there sound really cool and all. So, yeah, and you've got such different species. Um, I mean, you've got the cave geckos. To see cave geckos in the wild would just be insane. That'd be fabulous. You've got. Um, some really sort of Japanese endemic lizards, like the long tail lizards, the brazenos and stuff like that. You've got a raft of different salamanders that are specific to that part of you know Asia. Um, you've got the, all the different different killbacks. You've got um, the various um, the gloidius. You've got um, you've even got I think you've got Vipira. Not sure the distribution. Have you got Vipira stationensis? But you've, you've got a load of venomous stuff in Japan, which, uh, and then you've got all the different toads and stuff like that to see, which would be superb. You've got the torrent toads, and, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, that'd be cool. And then just top it off, top it all off. You have basically an amphibian crocodile. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, just the, the giant salamanders which aren't actually that rare it's, it's just to see that that would be i think there's like there's pinnacle species from each sort of area you're going to hurt 
I would say in Europe, it's probably that, you know, it's, it's for people that want to go out herping from other countries visiting, most people from Europe want to see either Vipera berus or Vipera amadites. If you go to places like Malaysia, most people are after seeing a king cobra or maybe a, a crite in one of the, you know, um, brighter coloured uh, crites. If you go to America, it's Crotalus atrox all day long. Everybody wants to see it. I know it's not rare, but it's just so iconic. I don't, honestly, yeah. I lost I lost my shit when I saw it. It's just phenomenal to actually hear and see one in the wild. It's just absolutely brilliant. Um, Japan, yeah, you've got the giant salamander. It's just these apex things to go and see. It's, um, Australia, I suppose people want to see either carpet pythons or maybe, I don't know, big scrubby or something like that. There's just certain, yeah. certain things that draw you to it, or it will be the apex thing to see in a, in a specific sort of yeah. locale. Yeah, the one thing that if you miss everything else, you just check that off, you feel completed, so to speak. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. See. So uh, with the way you keep all your animals, uh, you mentioned that uh, you keep your – you want to keep a lot of North American and then Iberian stuff just because the temperature requirements are so similar. you want to go in a little bit more detail about that? Yes, uh, yeah, I would. I mean, obviously, if you've got a, a massive area, multi rooms, it's not too difficult to keep Asian species with, um, which tend to be high humidity species with low humidity species, high heat species like Middle East and some of the North American stuff and so on and so on. Um, but I just feel the way I want to do it now, I think the hobby has come so far forward in the last five years you know it we're not as we're not as um advanced as fish keepers a friend of mine has just set up a new aquarium 350 litre aquarium he hasn't put any fish in it yet and it's cost him 1650 pounds so far <laughs> that is just on lighting and substrate and plants and filters and i think that's kind of the way our hobby is going not as as dramatic as that but yeah. my my game plan is to have um where i was keeping a lot of arboreal hip vipers my cages are tall and slim well now i'm going over to more um arid species desert species which are ground dwelling I want longer rather than tall cages. Um, so I want to completely take all the, I don't know how many there are, there's a lot of cages in there, but I want to completely start again from scratch with appropriate dimension cages for the species that I'm, I'm aiming to keep. Um, every single cage will have UVB, every single cage will have UVA, and every single cage will have decent not Japanese knockoff or Chinese knockoff, decent full spectrum lighting. Um, every single bank of cages will have Evo controllers on them. I don't know if you get those in the States, you probably do under a different name or something like that. It's, um, it, to say it's a thermostat, it's kind of selling it short. It, it kind of does it's everything for it's like a, a, like a thermostat control. and humidity and stuff like that yeah yeah it's like a controller for everything and it's bluetooth so wherever you are in the world you can see what's going on it reports to you by the second yeah. you can turn temperatures up and down the thing i like about that is you can program into it where you're so say most of your say that one bank of fibs they're all from a reasonable close area in north america so you've got just different types of Cerestes in that bank of vibs. Yeah. You you could then program it so that you get the kind of heat gradients you get in that area. So rather than the uh, heater just coming on, getting to 85 degrees and turning off, you get a gradual temperature range up to midday and then a gradual temperature drop to mimic exactly the wild conditions. Um, so I want everything fully automated 
A, because it's less work, but also I just think that it, that's much so much better to, not just the breeding, obviously it's going to hopefully help with breeding, but I just think for the well-being of the snake, I just think the proper temperature gradients, 100% um, UVA and UVB, it annoys the life out of me when people keep stuff in a drawer and say it's fine. It's surviving. It's not having its best life. You know, people in prison yeah. survive. They're not having their best life, do they? You know, there's a difference. We all know you walk out of your house into the sun, the sun hits you in the face, it feels nice. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science, is it? Um, so, I, and I've noticed, and particularly with the rattlesnakes, the rattlesnakes will move, come out of their, uh, their hides, go straight to where the UVA is because they know what time it's going to come on and they'll all sit underneath it and then they'll, they'll warm up and then they'll go about their business sort of thing. It's, it's clearly beneficial with the lizards, particularly like the, the Timon, um, the ones that I kept, I keep those indoors. Most of the other lizards like, uh, or the Felsumas UV, they love UV, the clamori. You see them just literally when the UV comes on, the clamori all come out. They're all sat under the UV. Um, so I, I personally think you shouldn't keep anything without that is a, a that is a day basking animal. I don't think we should be keeping day basking animals now without UV. There's no there's no excuse now. It's not expensive anymore. In the past, I can see it could have been expensive. There's such Good quality UV Arcadia Pro T5 kits. Why is people not putting those in all their vids? They're super easy to use. You can link them all up. So you're only plugging in one light. There's no wires hanging out all over the place. Um, but the controller will do the lighting and the heating. So it'd be all fully automated. Um, I've just got an air conditioning unit so that I can, again, keep the whole room at the sort of rough temperatures that I want. Um, and that's the thing with the North American rattlesnakes and the uh, Spanish stuff, they kind of need a decent night drop. So yeah. if your rooms insulate and stuff like that, you kind of need air conditioning to drop, 10 to drop the temperature 10, 15 degrees at night. So that's going in there. Um, yeah, I'm excited to do it. To be honest, it's uh, it's going to be an absolute mission because if you you know if you think of how many vivs I've got to get out, take the animals out, wire in the new light and electrics, substrate, build the design of viv that I want to look at visually, and also need to go back. You know, if you've got a pair of corn snakes, that's a day's work. When you've got X amount of snakes and they're venomous as well which you can't just put your hand in and pull it out and you know it's it's going to be you know it's going to be a massive task but i think when it's all done i think it will be so stress-free as much as you can with any you know live animal hobby just to walk into a lovely clean room all the vids are exactly the same everything's on timers for those that need it not that the many will need it for those that need it automatic spray system set up which I just got yesterday. I think um, it'll be an, it'll be a fun project, and yeah. I think I'll, I think I'll, once that's done, I think like anybody, I think I will enjoy keeping my animals more because it won't. It's not going to be a chore because I have fewer animals. I'm planning on probably only having somewhere in the region of 40, 50 snakes, not a lot compared to. When I, in the past, when I've had racking systems and stuff like that, and I've gone the other way, and I've had, and you end up like everybody does, pulling the drawer open, changing the water bottle, chucking a mouse in, shutting the drawer. You're not appreciating the snake. You're not seeing its behaviour. Um, and with the venomous stuff, is the the reason I've kind of gone for the rattlesnakes and the and the Euro Spanish vipers is they sit out all the time. They love to be out. They love to bask. You know, some of the um, the Trimerosaurus, you, you're basically just gardening. You don't actually see the snake. You know it's in somewhere in the trees, in the in the field, but you very you know, don't necessarily see it. Arth Atheris tend to sit out, but a lot of the Trimerosaurus don't don't sit out so much. So with the rattlesnakes, you know, to have a nice cage set up with decent, really light, and that enhances the animal. And you know, 
with the full spectrum, you can see the difference. Your animals look better under full spectrum light. Yeah. Particularly, I mean, the felsumas and the, the timor, they pop under UV light. Their colours look fantastic. Um, and the rattlesnake, even the rattlesnakes, which aren't necessarily brightly coloured animals, they look so much better under proper lighting. So, yeah, that's the way forward, I think. Yeah. I mean, the more I learned about rattlesnakes, the more uh, fascinating and interesting they became, become to me. Like uh, when I was uh, interviewing Sanders Drucker, who was a PhD candidate researcher studying rattlesnakes down like extreme southern New Mexico and stuff like that. He's telling me like to keep on discovering new stuff like about their social behavior that you would never yeah. think of. Like they actually prefer hanging out with certain individuals. Other, the basically, I don't know, quote unquote, half best friends more or less. But you know that's the reason I said quote unquote. You know, it's a snake. It's yeah. not exactly. Yeah, it's not exactly going down to the bar with their friends to have a couple of beers, but that'd be cool. Um, no, I completely agree. I mean, I, I rattlesnakes, I uh, tend to cohabit. I think they should be in a viv with other rattlesnakes. I do think they're quite a social snake. Um, you just mentioned your 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 the chat you interviewed. Mexico is another place I'd love to hurt. I don't think it's the oh, safest yeah. place. To, I don't think it's the <laughs> safest place to hurt though. That's the trouble. I think. Where a lot of the cool species are, you really don't want to be walking around so much, um, which is a shame. But it, it's on the list of places I'd like to go. Yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> if it didn't have all the problems, it probably would be one of the top destinations in the world for her thing. Oh, yeah. So. yeah it has all the diversity I mean, you can want. Yeah, it's got it's got the cloud forest stuff. It's got I think it's probably got more rattlesnakes than the United States. It's got it's got all the milk snakes. Um, but, you know, even though they were reclassified, they all look different. They might have now just lumped them all together, but they all look different areas. They all look yeah. so different. You've got from some fantastic, fantastic um, salamanders. And stuff. It's just like an incredible, incredible place to go and help. Unfortunately, you know you don't really want to end up in an orange jumpsuit with your head cut off and nailed to a pole. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I like being alive. So yeah yeah but i mean another top list for me to eventually go herping would be brazil just because you know little kid growing up watching nature documentaries someone just going in deep into the jungles i don't know, just stirs the adventure little adventure in me so to speak oh 100 you know both rocks and stuff like that It'd be very very cool yeah yeah so, uh, is there anything else you would like to talk about? Um, oh, good, I think. I think we've covered quite a lot, to be honest. Um, I would just put a little shout out. Um, I just started listening to another podcast, which I you may already know. It. It's called Herpolo Herpetological Highlights. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So I that as well. Yeah, I, I only recently discovered it. and it's fast there's something for everyone on there whatever species that you're particularly into they, they you know if you go back through their episodes they've probably done uh, a little thing on the latest scientific papers on it so yeah i would um recommend everyone having a listen to that i'm going to plug um obviously npr network there's a lot of stuff on there and uh oh if anyone would like to follow me on Instagram, that would be great because I'm trying to get over a thousand followers. I'm getting there, nearly there. But yeah, follow me at Nipper Reed on Instagram. Um, I post, normally post a lot when I go on a trip. If I'm not on a trip, I don't post very much, but I am about to go to Milos. So uh, there should be some, a lot of stuff hitting that fairly soon. Um, and have a listen to, if you're into your Venomous, have a listen to Venom Exchange Radio. That's about it, mate. And we're back. Just wanted to talk about something really interesting that just came up. Uh, so you're about to tell me about uh, why about uh, Lampropel's Getula being now kind of banned in Europe. You want to talk about that? Yeah, they've um, just passed a, a law in Europe, uh, that's mainland Europe, um, to prohibit the um, keeping of any of the lowland milk snake forms with a getula, um, 
complex. Um, you're allowed to keep the ones you have. So you've got granddad rights. You can keep them until they die. Um, but the sale and um, trade of them, you, you can't do. You're not supposed to breed them and you're not supposed to give them to anybody. Um, it only applies to mainland Europe. So in the UK, because we've Brexited, the rules don't apply to us. Um, but yeah, it's it's the prices have just plummeted on them because everybody's now desperate to get rid of them before the law actually comes in. I think it's kind of off the back of um, somebody released some in the Canary Islands, which are islands off the coast of Africa, but they're actually owned by Spain and they're, they're a beautiful place to herp. I've herped a number of Canary Islands and they're each canary island has its own endemic species so each canary island will have an endemic lizard an endemic skink and an endemic gecko some of the bigger islands have more than one species of lizard and they get bigger and bigger and bigger but they're really really important little biospheres because each island has had a lot of um evolution for those species on there and they're very, very adapted to these islands and they're volcanic islands. They're, they're very, very dry. There's very little vegetation. Um, so the, the um, flora is mainly thorn bushes and succulents and cacti and that sort of thing. So it's a very specific environment. Uh, and somebody let these snakes, these uh, king snakes go and um, they're decimating wildlife. they are really taken over um they're breeding like crazy so i think there's been a reaction to that the the, the side of these is is actually uh, going to be prohibited in a few months time um but in europe they've also believe it or not and i find this incredible the cave racers um the chianicordia you know it's not chianicordia what's the cave racers oh i can't think the ridley eye and the others can't think what the uh, the Latin name for them are. But you know what I mean, the, the, the um, like Ridley's Cave Racer and so on. Someone's yep. released someone's released those in Belgium, and they are again breeding really, really successfully. Now you think this is this is a snake from Asia with stable temperatures, and it's living in a country that has really harsh winters and snow, but the snakes seem to be coping with it really really well and, and, and breeding really really well um huh. so whether they'll, they'll do us the same sort of ban for that sort of thing i don't know but um yeah the, the prices of any of the uh etching the species is hemorrhaging they're, they're coming down so much at the minute um people can't get rid of them quick enough which for people in the uk is, is ideal yeah yeah so it kind of reminds me of a, a lot of the Caribbean species of lizard that get established in Florida seem to somehow spread very far north with very little problem. Seems like like a anole sequestrous, a you know nine anoles, a brown anoles, uh, curly tail lizards. All these like typical Caribbean species get very far up north into Florida. Even like especially brown anoles, they spread well out of Florida now, pretty much all along the coastal part of the southeast, where it can get fairly cold in the winters on occasion and they, they're just there so i don't know how they do it but they do it yeah very very adaptable species yeah probably relic cold tolerant genes from last glaciation event but yeah all right well uh thanks for coming on absolute pleasure thanks for asking really appreciate it my pleasure.